Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we're studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse. And I just ask your blessings upon this teaching as it continues to go forward. We are grateful for the privilege and the opportunity that you've given us to just come together and fellowship around your word. We thank you, Lord, for all of the abundant blessings that you've given us in Christ that we continue to see throughout this epistle. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts the truth of your word. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I'm out here at the film location where we're making our film on the rapture we we were out here Saturday and we shot some footage that the uh, according to the editing it uh, it appears as if that we've got about six minutes of film seven closer to seven minutes of film so we will continue on with that We've been studying together here in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and I'd like to direct your attention to Romans chapter 14, verses 13 through 17. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this, rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I never liked that word ghost. Ghost implies a disembodied person. The word is pneuma, spirit. In the book of Leviticus, just that, that one book alone, the word unclean occurs over a hundred times. At least over a hundred times. Paul, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, the Hebrew student at the, the, the feet of uh, Gamil, a fantastic student of the scriptures as far as the law was concerned and blameless imagine the Holy Spirit saying to this apostle to this Pharisee I want you to write down there's nothing unclean of itself imagine that with so many references to unclean in Leviticus and all of a sudden there's nothing unclean of itself and yet in the law, the Apostle Paul, who had been a Pharisee of the Pharisees, had a tremendous list of that which is unclean and that which makes unclean. And now all of a sudden there's a tremendous change. You know, there was a time when he was absolutely persuaded that there were many, many things that were unclean. And he ordered his life that way. And now all of a sudden... Nothing is unclean of itself. And that, and that change occurred in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've had 11 chapters of doctrine, folks, where that, that we are now persuaded that we're not under law anymore. We're under grace. That we are no longer persuaded that we are condemned by things that are unclean. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. It was God who foreknew us, who chose us, who justified us, who glorified us, who called us and 
we now see that Paul starts out by saying he's been absolutely persuaded by the Lord Jesus. And it's, by the way, it's a perfect tense. I don't believe anyone else could have persuaded him but the Lord Jesus. Being skilled in the law as he was, it must have taken a special revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ himself to persuade Paul to be totally persuaded of this. And to go on to say that he that esteems anything to be unclean to him, it really is unclean. It really is unclean. And that man should not violate his conscience. And in my last couple of videos, I think I, I spent some time explaining how that there is a difference between doctrinal issues and non-doctrinal issues. It's amazing what we do with the brethren. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. First of all, it's our brother in this chapter. It's the weaker brother that distinguishes between meats, not the strong one. If thy brother be grieved with thy meat, and that, and now that's a passive voice, and we have to understand this because it seems to me most of the commentaries that I read on this passage of Scripture seem to say that this brother saw you doing something that he doesn't think you ought to, uh, you should be doing, or he wouldn't do, and then he's grieved with that, and you're not walking in love, but it is a passive voice. Pick any, you know, anything. Go fishing on Sunday, or 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 eat pork, or you know, play cards, go to the movies, smoke, drink, whatever, whatever you want. People have told me for decades, and they continue to tell me what we ought to be doing or not doing should be not be doing, and I tell them that's law. You're not going to put me under law. And people have said, well, now, wait a minute. God doesn't change. We know God, I, the Lord thy God, changeth not. If, if that's the way that he felt in Leviticus, well, then that's the way he feels now. But those who tell me that are not looking at Christ in Leviticus, nor are they looking at Christ here. Believe me, dearly beloved, all we're studying here is based upon the finished work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You think it's wrong to eat pork, and you invite me to your house, I'm not going to eat pork, okay? I'm not going to sit there and make fun of you and, and ask your wife to fix me a piece of pork, even though you won't eat it. That's the passive voice. I'm enticing you. Okay, if you come to my house, I'm probably not going to eat pork because I don't want to put a temptation before you. Folks, I don't want to force you or entice you to do something that's against your convictions. If I want to be at the creek fishing Sunday afternoon and, and you have a problem with me doing that, you're probably not going to get invited to go with me. But if we're at a church supper and they serve pork, I'm going to eat it and, and you watch me eat it and don't dare declare that you're grieved by watching me eat it. I'm not enticing you in any way to violate what your conscience says is wrong. Bear in mind, the verse before said, If you esteem it to be unclean, then to you it is unclean, and you shouldn't do it. But the verse does not say that because you see me do it, that I've grieved you. That's not what it says. The passive voice says, I've enticed you to operate against your conviction, and I shouldn't do that. I'm not walking in love if I do that. I recognize your conviction. I won't make fun of it, and I won't entice you to violate it, okay? If you think it's wrong to go, you know, fish on Sunday, I won't tell you that you're crazy, and you ought to go fishing as well, but it won't stop me from going. You know, I, I might just need a few crappie in the skillet, you know, in Sue's frying pan. 
there are certain movies I won't watch and certain movies I will. I've had people say, you know, do you think it's wrong to watch Yellowstone? And I always answer, you know, you think it's wrong to read books. There are some books I think it's wrong to read, and there are some books I don't think it's wrong to read. Now, those are my personal convictions. That's between me and the Lord. I'd never entice you to operate against your conscience. And the verse says, Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. And boy, that is a hammer blow. First of all, the word for there is huper. Destroy not with thy meat someone in whose place Jesus Christ died. His love for them is so great, he died in their place, and we say, yep, can't be, can't be done. I, I mean, d dumb as he is, you know, crazy, screwy convictions, you know, wait a minute. This is one who believes Jesus Christ died in his or her place, who believes that he or, or she is redeemed by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not talking about law. We're not talking about somebody who says you got to give up pork to go to heaven. Now, we're not talking about somebody who has a doctrinal screwy idea, but there are many people who absolutely believe that they are redeemed by the substitutionary death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, who believe it's a sin to fish on Sunday. And I always try to point out it's a sin for them to fish on Sunday. And it really is. As the Bible says, it really is. But it may not be a sin for somebody else. The text says, destroy not, and it's an imperative, him with thy meat, the one in whose place Jesus Christ died. That's the love of God that we see in the scriptures. We're not redeemed because of the way we live, which is, well, which is something my character in this, in this upcoming film on the rapture would have done well to learn. I thought I'd give myself a, a, a challenging role. We are not redeemed because of the way we live. We have that coming up very, very shortly. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. We're not redeemed because of what we do. We are not redeemed because what we believe. And you folks and I, we are besieged by that every single day, particularly here in a, in a so-called Bible Belt in the South or Midwest or uh, wherever, wherever you want to consider we're at here in uh, Southeast Oklahoma. Uh, where, you know, where you can find all kinds of religious broadcasting. You know, do you want to be born again? Then accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But if you're not already born again, you can't do that. We've had 14 chapters that, that, to tell us that we can't do that. You go into any Bible bookstore, and I challenge you to find any book that will tell you how to be born again. Uh, I mean, you know, oh, there'll be lots of them, but they'd be wrong. You're born from above by the will of God, and because you are his sheep, you believe. And I didn't make all of that up, okay? That's what the Word says. And people read by it as though it isn't there. You were born by the will of God. If you're not born from above, you can't believe. Nicodemus was clearly told that, and the disciples were told in John 10 that if they were not already his sheep, they could not believe. And somebody on the TV or the radio tells me, if I believe, I'll be born again. When the scriptures tell me, if I'm not his sheep, I can't believe. And if I'm born again, I will. That only his sheep believe. People want to make it the product of some human activity, which is a byproduct of the fall. So should we separate from those people? Absolutely not. I mean, I'm sure some of my dear friends and, and followers on Facebook believe that one is born again because of something that they did. Most of modern Christianity believes that nonsense. But they are the very ones that need to hear it. 
The reason I keep my friend list on Facebook under 100 is not because I disagree with most of the world. I do that so that I can actually get to know the people that I interact with, which I couldn't do if I had 5,000 followers. And that's important to me. It has to do with the relationship factor, not thousands of, uh, thousands of names on a list, most of which you don't know. And, and so you say, well, Steve, I didn't have anything to do with my first birth, birth uh, coming forth from my mother's womb, uh, but I have everything to do with my second birth. And I don't know where you reach that conclusion, and that is a doctrinal issue, and I should not separate from you on those grounds. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Don't ruin him with the way that you live, for Christ died in his place. Think of that. Think of that. You could ruin that brother. You can't, send, you can't send him to hell. Okay? That's not what the word destroy, the, the word is uh, apollomy in the Greek. That's not what the word means. But by enticements, you can lead him to operate against his conscience. And the verse before said that if he esteems it to be unclean, it really is unclean. So now you've led him into ruin. Note the context. The context. We will give an account for how we built on Christ. Okay? And that's what we're doing here. This is a brother for whom Christ died. The solicitation to me in verse 15, it's really no different than any solicitation. We see the same thing in life. Life in general. You know, that's what enticement is. Well, come on, try it. Everybody else is doing it. But that might, that might not mean that I should do it. Let not then your, your good be evil spoken of. This chapter is really addressed to the strong brother, the one who eats anything, who esteems every day alike, the one who doesn't have any scruples concerning the way he lives his life. And I pointed out that that, that doesn't mean, you know, I... Uh, that I don't understand murder to be unclean, so I'm going to commit murder. You know, you can't do that. That's not the text of this chapter. We're not dealing with things that we know to be sin, lying, stealing, murder, adultery, and so forth. Things that we know are clearly sin. These are personal convictions. Like, if you do them, you know, you, you, know, you, know, like, you, know, you stand in fear of, of hell, and I don't agree with that. So hopefully you see the contrast in this here in, 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 from what we're looking at here and that which we read in 1 Corinthians 5.11. But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler not even to eat with such a one. You, you, are you getting me here? What the text does not say, it doesn't say, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's mid-trib or post-trib or he doesn't like to go fishing on Sunday or he doesn't like he, he can't eat pork that's not what the text is saying what the text is saying here is that if it's wrong to you it's 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 wrong and don't push that on someone else as an absolute necessary adjunct to living with Jesus Christ but by all means abide by your own conviction Let not then, let not then your good be evil spoken of. The word is blasph blasphemeo, where we get our word blasphemy. What is my good? The finished work of Jesus Christ. The fact that I'm not under law but under grace, that sin shall not have dominion over me, that God holds me in his hand, that after he's tested me, I shall come forth as gold because Jesus Christ, my Redeemer, died in my place. And I will not die because Jesus Christ bore my sins as my substitute. I stand before him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. I think that's the good that's being talked about here. And believe me, that's good. We walk in an area that is centered in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and we should walk in union with Christ. We should walk 
in union with one another. We should walk in newness of spirit in such a way that Christ is not blasphemed. You know, I'm absolutely amazed that Christ never talked about screen doors, you know, you know, which would have kept the flies and the mosquitoes out. You know, he could have been an inventor instead of a carpenter. You know, better highways, you know, would have helped. But none of that's important. What he came to do was redeem his own. And so our lives should be such that the sphere in which we live, which is the person in the work of Jesus Christ, should not be blasphemed. And I am not to entice a brother or try to change his mind as it regards personal convictions that are separate from doctrine. If he's a child of the Lord, I'm supposed to help guide, direct, and instruct him. And if you believe that if I go fishing on Sunday, I'm going to lose my salvation, well, then you and I are are likely to have some discussion and I'm going to try to lead you into deeper truth. If you say, no, I don't think it has anything to do with, uh, with re our redemption, I just don't think you ought to do that to honor the Lord, then I'm, I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to honor your conviction and I'm not going to try to lead you into any so-called deeper truth that won't make one bit of difference whether you go to heaven or hell. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Look, I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.